Today I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of other things other than just Iraq and Katrina. Um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of photos. I'd, I'd spend a bunch of time blabbering on in slides, uh, where I'm from, what kind of crap I do, um, where I've been recently, um, why I care. Um, and I'm not even going to bother with any of these slides, because I don't think that there's any point in showing you a bunch of slides. So I'll just show you what I saw, and I'll tell you a story because I think a story is um, more moving. Um, so I'm going to start off by telling you about photography. So I see the world through a camera. I, uh, I work with computers for nonprofits usually, but when I'm not doing that, I take photographs. And for the last two years, I was a caretaker for my terminally ill father. And in December of last year, one year and eight days ago or something, um, my dad was murdered. Um, my dad was a heroin addict, and uh, so as a result, in American society, nobody really cared about him. And it was a really difficult time for me because the situation was very complicated, and there was really no justice for him. So, due to the fact that he was a drug addict and due to the very peculiar way in which he was poisoned, um, the people that killed him got away with it. The sheer incompetence of the San Francisco Police Department, where I'm from in California, uh, is astounding to me. When we talk about the like oncoming police state that can bust anybody for doing anything, that can come down on all of us for little infractions. This kind of stuff makes me doubt it, but at the same time, it really is a value judgment. Um, people that don't care about other humans, that devalue other human beings, they're not gonna really worry about justice for them or, or punishing them, because it's just one parasite wiping out another parasite. And so these are just a couple of photos of my father right before he died. And there he is dead. So this right here is the motivator for me to stop contributing to a world full of bullshit evil. It was the motivator for me to get off my ass and connect with the things that I'd been working towards already. I, uh, like I said, I'd been working with nonprofits, places like Greenpeace, Rainforest Action Network, mostly environmental stuff, but also occasionally with human rights activists. And uh, all these stories about people being victimized, about really terrible things happening, they, uh, they never really hit home for me until I saw this photo that I took. And it was almost like I wasn't even there when I took this photo. It was like another world. And uh, it's pretty much this moment that I decided that I had two choices, which was that I could take something really terrible and make something else really terrible, or I could take something terrible and make something great. So I decided that I needed to leave the United States because it wasn't a very positive place for me. And after some amount of time, I did this. And I went into Iraq. I had some connections in uh, Greenpeace that allowed me to, luckily, uh, it allowed me to uh, get past places that you otherwise would not be able to. So I flew into Istanbul and I left a couple of documents behind that would keep me safe in the event of someone uh, kidnapping me, supposedly. Although I basically had no regard for myself. Um, I decided that I wanted to go and connect with people who had been in a similar situation as mine, connect with people who the world had left behind. I wanted to basically make transparent what other people knew, but they didn't really know, they didn't really see it, and I wanted to connect people to it. So I started blogging about my travel in Iraq. And while I was traveling, I let people ask questions, and I did in video interviews with local Iraqis. And I went out on the streets, and uh, I took photographs of people. And I helped set up uh, internet access at Iraqi voting stations. I climbed some mountains in Ahmadawa, which was where Saddam dropped chemical weapons during the Anfal campaign to, to uh, commit genocide against the Kurds. And I... Uh, I basically just settled in there for a little while, not very long. 
Um, and I, I talked to people and asked them how they were doing. I asked them what they wanted. And to this day, I still talk to my friends that are in Iraq. Um, I didn't travel with the US military. I traveled by myself in a taxi cab from Turkey. Um, although I did run into the US military several times, they uh, didn't really cause me any trouble. So the way that you would want to, if you were interested in crossing over the border, is you would fly from Istanbul to a city called Diyarbakir. And at Diyarbakir, you would take a taxi cab to the border, the border city of Zakhau. And the way that you would take this taxi cab is by basically either speaking Kurdish or Arabic, of which I speak neither. Um, the very little teeny bit of German that I do speak probably saved my life a number of times. But um, essentially, when you get to the border, you have some money in your passport, and you hand it over to them. And when they ask you why you're there, you tell them that you're a tourist. And um, they'll laugh, because they think that's pretty funny and uh, they'll flag you across. One of the notable uh, adventures on this taxi cab ride from Diyarbakir to Zakhau is the fact that you drive through the holy city of Batman, which is excellent. It's a good sign. You're on your way to doing good things. So once I'd crossed over the border, I met with my contacts that I had previously had through Greenpeace, and um, they handed me several firearms, and we got into their car and drove away. And we drove through a small village of the Yazidi, or Yezdiz, depending on who you ask. They are a group of people that worship a peacock by the name of Malak Talas, which for the longest time I've been interested in, in seeing. And so I went and I asked them what it was like for them during the war, what it was like before the war, whether or not they were happy that Saddam was gone. It was quite a big game of telephone because it was uh, English to Arabic to Kurdish to the local dialect that the Yazidi spoke and back. So there were like three translators and me and some guy. And um, it was quite a long conversation, but those people were actually, surprisingly enough, very happy with the fact that America had invaded because it was beneficial to them. But that's to be expected when you're talking to people in the Kurdish regions of Iraq, because they are the people that primarily benefit. So essentially, while I was, uh, while I was traveling through this region, talking with them, I had been traveling with um, Arab guards from Baghdad. And these people uh, were very, very kind, very nice to me. Uh, and uh, they took me to a city by the name of Arbil, or Arbil, depending on who you ask. And uh, those people um, took me to a place where I'd be safe, and I stayed outside of the wire. Pretty much everyone stays outside of the wire, though. Um, the wire being the green zone in Baghdad, or uh, these like military bases where the US military sits. Um, you, if you're in a situation like this, the only time that you ever want to talk to the US military is when you tell them that you're in charge and you're going to be going now. Because it could be very dangerous, and you could end up very dead very quickly. So. Well, in uh, Erbil, I visited a number of sites, and I interviewed a number of people, and one of the things that I saw was uh, a zoo full of animals that were not native, and I went and sort of uh, documented this, uh, uh, this zoo, took photographs of the animals, and uh, I basically, uh, I, felt, I felt pretty bad about the animals that were there. They were pretty much the most abused animals I've ever seen in my entire life. And the animals in the zoo were, quite like everyone in Iraq. They were all very, very afraid of the master with the boot on its neck. And so I decided at, at that point that I needed to start asking them questions. Um, and these questions that I asked them, I, would, I collaborated with people online. I had a blog where I asked people to ask questions from different perspectives, everything from, are you happy here now, uh, now that the, uh, the American forces are here? Do you, do you feel safe now? And, do you think that uh, every day uh, is a good day? Um, do you feel free? Just really simple questions to questions ranging from that to things like, do you see any profits from oil? Do you see anything changing? Uh, have you had anyone in your family killed? Uh, has anyone that you've known been killed? I mean, what, what, what is it like here for you? What is your life like? And pretty much everyone that I talked to that was Kurdish was very happy about the Americans because the Kurdish region, as I said before, had been liberated by the Americans, but the Arabs that I met from Baghdad were not so happy 
the standard operating procedure, they told me, of a car driving into an American convoy was to have it shot dead, stop. They shoot a 50 caliber machine gun across the engine block of the car, through the windshield, and kill the driver, no questions asked. Just because you might be a bomber. Just because you could pose a threat to someone. And most of these people have a university level education, the ones that I've been talking to. Uh, and their computer science degree, I think this would probably amuse most of you, uh, means that they have been able to program in Fortran on Windows 3.1 or Windows 95 if they were really lucky. Now, a lot of these people all served in the military. They fought in the, the, most of them fought in the first Gulf War, but not in the second Gulf War, including a sniper uh, who actually admitted that he had shot uh, American soldiers, which was quite, he was quite interesting. He, he basically conveyed that he felt very bad for having done this, and he every day saw the repercussions of constantly killing each other, what the war was doing and what it solved. And he said that it was worse now with the Americans than it was with Saddam, and that even though it's possible it could turn out better, that he felt that hundreds of thousands of people had been killed by the Americans. Just recently, I heard my glorious leader, George Bush, in America saying that the body count was around 30,000, which I'm not sure how he arrived at that figure because it's pretty much impossible to keep body counts like that. I mean, 30,000 reported deaths by American corporate media, right? So that must be how he came to that. So these engineers needed some help with a lot of their software problems, so I brought them Nopix disks and I taught them how to do some network penetration. And we had a long conversation about security. So a lot of these Iraqi engineers walked away <laughs> learning how to do stuff with, uh, I don't know, writing shell code and, and map and using just simple things to more complex uh, concepts so that they have a better idea for keeping Iraq a little more secure. He turned them on to free software instead of using proprietary software, which was, I think, perhaps a little useful for them. Um, one of the things that I needed when I crossed over the border was a, was a photocopy of my passport, which if you're going to cross across the Turkish-Iraqi border, you need to have that so that you can give it to the, uh, the Iraqi uh, and the Turkish guards. And another thing that would be helpful for you to have is press passes. I suggest that you make your own press pass and do not work for a press agency unless you, of course, do work for a press agency, but don't forge a press pass that says like you work for NBC or CNN or something, because you're just going to get yourself in a lot of trouble if anyone goes digging. Make up your own press agency instead. It works out a lot better. Your own phone numbers, your own addresses, things like that. So if you're going to go also leave your plans, your intended destinations, and all these things in countries that are nearby to you, don't leave it in, say, America and hope that someone there will be able to find you in the event of your kidnapping and ultimate beheading. So you'll probably also find yourself in a situation where you, this, since this is Europe, you'll probably be very uh, uncomfortable with this next statement, but um, you may end up having to carry firearms to defend yourself, or at least in order to keep yourself from being the low-hanging fruit on the tree. While I was there, I had an AK-47, uh, a Glock, and a Browning 9mm because the sheer gun on my shoulder, one on my back, one in my pocket, those things stood out, much like a uh, white American with weird hair and earrings. And those things probably kept people from bothering me when there were other people that looked a lot easier to bother. Um, certainly, though, you would never want to go out alone. Always travel with other people. And when you do go out, make sure you have a very good reason. So some of the video interviews that I've done, I've put up online, um, almost all of them actually, and they're under the Creative Commons. And while I was uh, documenting most of this with uh, photography, videography, um, I put it all under the Creative Commons so that people could take it for free because the information was more important than whatever intellectual property, uh, whatever money I could possibly make from it. The people in Iraq are in a very bad place, and it's funny to me that it took my father being killed to really realize that, to, to really to bring myself around to, to feeling connected with someone else. It took tragedy for that to happen. And uh, 
that's that's quite unfortunate, and hopefully it doesn't have to happen to the rest of you that way. And hopefully you can take the time that you have on this planet and do very good things. People like Dan Kaminsky and Rob Gongrip, these people that that are really a part of the scene, that are really contributing, we should all strive to be more like them. Because those people, developers of free operating systems, those people are giving things to the world that has a tangible quality that improves the life of these people. We should no longer stand idly by and letting, letting these things happen. Because we're all responsible, ultimately, socially, ethically, morally, for the terrible things that have happened in Iraq and around the entire world. So to touch on some, some slightly nerdy subjects here, the, the way that I was able to distribute the videos while I was blogging because of high demand was because of BitTorrent. And the legitimacy of BitTorrent could shouldn't ever be questioned. Any peer-to-peer -peer software can be used, but I was using BitTorrent to distribute my videos, and as a result, it was actually affordable for me to do so. So these Iraqis who otherwise had never had a voice before, who no one had ever listened to them before, no one outside of Iraq has ever even met them because they're not even allowed to leave Iraq because no country in the world will take an Iraqi citizen because they could be a terrorist or some other bullshit excuse that denies them their basic right to a standard of living that is acceptable. So using BitTorrent, we were able to get it out there, peer-to-peer -peer software. However, the way that we had to get online was using what's called a very small aperture terminal, or a VSAT. There are several other methods for communication when you're in a place like Iraq. Coincidentally, it also works in disaster areas like Katrina. You can get stuff like a Thoraya sat phone, you can get Iridium gear, you can get a Hughes, Tachyon, some VSAT. So the VSAT channels that we were using were monitored by the United States government. And there's definitely no question about that. The United States government, oh, I don't know, name a three-letter acronym. They all read my blog. And you'd be surprised that they don't hide their reverse IP information. But they don't. <laughs> but maybe there's a good reason for that. Maybe they wanted me to know. Um, during, during my time there, I um, actually was contacted by uh, what I believe is a United States Navy intelligence officer who came to the area where I was and just sort of told me maybe I should go home. Maybe it was not so safe there. And maybe I should, you know, get out of here because really, this isn't the place for me. But I pressed on and some of the things that I saw were pretty amazing there. Things that, I, I mean, it's hard to fathom, but there are abandoned buildings along the highways there that when you drive, when you drive through them and you stop in these buildings and you look inside, there are drawings on the wall that children have done of helicopters shooting their parents with machine guns and rockets blowing up buildings. And I mean, where do you suppose those helicopters came from? <laughs> um, I don't think they were made in Kurdistan, probably. I mean, I imagine they probably weren't paid for with Kurdish dollars either. So again, I found myself just feeling really awful about what we'd contributed to, even though we don't all willingly contribute thinking that that's what we're contributing to. We certainly do contribute through other means. When we pay our taxes, when we are silent, when we hear people being bigots, racists, homophobes, when we hear people being xenophobic, when we hear them being nationalist, we're contributing when we don't shut them up through intelligent, rational discourse, through transparency, through showing them that what they are doing is wrong and that these humans in Iraq are equal to all of us. Just because they speak another language, they look a little bit differently, because they have a different religion, they're still humans. And unfortunately, there seems to be a problem in my country where we can rationalize bombing and killing these people. Surely I thought that that was impossible for it to ever happen in the United States though. Certainly, if something terrible like this were to happen there, people in America would care and they would not stand for it. And I thought that that was the case until Katrina. Hit. And when Katrina hit, I was working, uh, doing some bullshit programming job somewhere, and my company had just laid everyone off. Uh, I decided that one night while at a party in San Francisco, I heard a bunch of people saying, oh, turn off that television. I don't want to hear any more about this bad news going on in New Orleans and in Houston. I don't care about those poor black people. Seriously, who cares about those people? I was so infuriated that I turned the television on. 
up louder, and I stood in front of it and took the remote and asked them how it is that they could deny the fact that these humans were suffering, that they could just go about having a party, having a good time, while these people were living inside of the Astrodome, or while there were people floating in the rivers and the streets. How, when this little girl is staring down at the remnants of her family, of her neighborhoods, and her friends, people could just stand idly by. I heard people blaming them for their poverty, people blaming them for their crassness, for their lack of education, how they couldn't get out when they had been so amply warned. But when I got there and I talked to these people, I heard stories that amazed me. Stories like when they were trying to cross the bridge from New Orleans into Algiers, which is on the other side of the Mississippi River, <laughs> I heard them saying that the police turned their guns on them and said, no fucking niggers on this side of the river, thank you very much, and then cocked their shotguns. Can you imagine? That happened in my country. I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't fucking believe that. That was so absurd, so enraging, so angering to me that I decided that I would expose that, that I would blog about it, that I would write about it. And lots and lots and lots of people saw this. Tim Pritlove, thank you very much for the support that you've given me on, during this trip. Uh, he had hooked us up with some video streaming, and he had also uh, written about us a little bit in his blog and linked us around. Um, Thanks to that attention, a lot of the photographs that I've taken here were published in European newspapers, which is really awesome. They were all under the Creative Commons, so there was no question about any uh, speed for the publishing of the photos. Anyone could publish them anytime, just to show it. And I interviewed these people. I infiltrated through the security of the Astrodome, um, along with one other reporter, who said that the security situation in the United States with regard to the press was something akin to the USSR. And I thought, this is my country? What's going on here? I don't understand. I mean, wh wh why? Why is this happening? And when we were in there, we were almost forcibly removed twice. And my traveling partner, Joel Johnson, who you may know from Gizmodo, he, uh, <laughs> he was actually removed from the building, and they almost arrested him for this, because th this was not right for him to, uh, to be inside. This was, this was like a special place. And the reason it was a special place is because when I asked people how they were being treated, they didn't have very nice things to say. They were being treated pretty badly. There were people whose civil liberties were just entirely stripped away. It's pretty amazing. People who, in order to have a bed in this shelter, had to go through strip searches because they looked like they might be gangsters, who weren't allowed to have radios because black people listen to rap, and rap incites violence. Pretty amazing, that's uh, it's a little bit of a disconnect. And uh, I believe it was uh, George Bush's mother that said, well, what are they so upset about? It seems like they've got it better now than they ever had it before. It's kind of a disconnect. It's like these people aren't human or something. So I hooked up with the indie media in Houston and we decided we were going to set up a radio station. So we thought we'd go through the proper channels. We uh, got the FCC permits and everything. And then the bureaucracy at the Astrodome kicked in and they said, oh, you can't use our power here. And your FCC permits say you're only allowed to broadcast in the building, so I guess you can't have your little radio station. And the purpose of this radio station was to help these people, to give them information about people that had been found, children that had been found, people that had died, information on jobs, things to help boost their morale, things like, uh, Here's a, if you want to come, the first hundred people get free movie tickets. So we're dispersing money. Just general freedom of information. They said the only way you can set up that radio station is if you get 10,000 radios with batteries and you distribute it. So we got 10,000 radios the next day. And they said there's no fucking way that you're going to ever get those radios in there. What happens when they have freedom of the dial? Freedom of the dial? What is that? Freedom of the dial? Well, what if they were to tune to another radio station? What if they were to listen to that rap music? <laughs> so I dug up all the information on all the bureaucrats and posted it online, and uh, they got some phone calls. And uh, it was posted around some pretty prominent weblogs. 
Some people like uh, Shani Jardin at Boing Boing really supported me in this endeavor. And, well, I think they got more than a couple of phone calls anyway. But eventually, uh, they caved and we were able to get the radio station set up. They, they only let us set up the radio station outside, though. Uh, at this point, I had pretty much given up on doing anything else here. So we had collected some hardware donations, and it was at this point that I had had a call to arms from a friend that I'd worked with previously. He said that they needed some help in, in New Orleans. And it was at that point that I decided it was time to go with my partner in a van. We loaded up with all the supplies that we could possibly fill because you would create an unnecessary burden on the disaster area if you were to come in and ask for their, their meals ready to eat, their water, their medical supplies. So we brought a bunch of stuff, enough stuff that we could hopefully share with other people. And we also brought a bunch of computers and we also brought internet access. Because that, my friends, is what is really important. Information, the ability to send information, and the ability to have an open network so people can receive information. So, we left, and we drove into New Orleans by way of Baton Rouge. We did satellite reconnaissance using Google Maps so that we could have some semblance of an idea of what it would be like on the road. And as it just so happens, on the road, most of the roads were flooded. So getting in posed a little bit of a challenge. Um, one of the wonderful things, though, was that we saw some roads that were not flooded, that were very clearly <laughs> uh, not under military watch. So we snuck around the checkpoints. Just stopping here for a second so I can show you some of a select photograph. I took out the photos of dead bodies that I took because I figured this was a depressing enough talk as possible and I wanted to somehow talk about how we hadn't lost the war and all that nonsense. But, oh well, it doesn't matter. So we made contacts with US military people over the telephone and through some clever social engineering, we were able to convince them that yes, indeed, we were allowed to go inside and that yes, indeed, they were going to let us and yes, indeed, if they could please just tell everyone below them about that, we'd be very happy, thank you very much. And um, the way that that was possible was by talking to people on the ground who identified needs and had given us certain pieces of information. And at the time, the radical anarchist collective that we were working with had not been named. It is now called the Common Ground Collective. But those people had basically stopped serious race riots and had set up or started to set up a medical clinic. They'd also set up food in Algiers. And this is a place where it was totally abandoned by the Red Cross. The National Guard was there, but they weren't really doing very much. And there were strange white militias roaming around, throwing people of color on the ground, thinking that they were looters. And in this context, a looter is someone who is trying to get clean drinking water so that they don't die. <laughs> so the police, of course, really did nothing in this situation. We all know the story. George Bush told the Canadian government that we didn't need their help, told the rest of the world we didn't need their help. And like the stubborn, pig-headed fuck that he is, all those people who needed our help died people sitting on their roofs for days at a time. Although the Canadian government, much to their credit, actually arrived in parts of New Orleans before the American government did. So, Royal Mounted Canadian Police landing and saving people because FEMA, the uh, Federal Emergency Fucked Up Management Agency, I think something like this, um, was getting uh, volunteer firefighters from all over the nation to come down and help. But before they could help, they actually had to uh, it's funny, watch history of FEMA classes for I think a week so that they could learn about the history of FEMA. And then they used them to hand out flyers in cities nowhere near the disaster. FEMA also did stuff like cutting the communications telephone lines of everyone around. So I believe it was the city of Gretna, uh, maybe? I'm not exactly sure, so don't quote me on that. But uh, they, they'd cut communication lines. So we realized that we had to have wireless connections for everything. So we had noticed also that the cell phone towers had been taken down, in some cases by the hurricane, probably other cases just by other people. Um, and 
we were able to see that they had set up cows, which were basically portable uh, clusters for cell phones. Um, and we were able to use EVDO, which is a 3G network, for sharing out and setting up a lab, a media center, so that we could get people to register for FEMA, which is basically worthless, but they needed to register for FEMA so that they could get money, supposedly. Um, during that time, the cell phone network was very much on and off, and most of the people that were there were there because they were seriously ill, seriously poor, seriously disabled, seriously distraught, without transportation, abandoned by their government, abandoned by their fellow countrymen. So what ended up happening is that it's still happening, and New Orleans is still in a bad place. It's not nearly as bad as it was here. There was a point while I was in New Orleans where a dead body sat on the street for 10 days in the sun. 10 days, at least. And the guy didn't have any shoes on, and the soles of his feet weren't dirty. And he was so bloated that you wouldn't know how he died. And the police, when we pleaded with them to please, please come clean up this body because there were children that lived right next door to it, said, oh, that's not my responsibility, that's someone else. And the military, all of them, and the police, and even the Blackwater mercenaries operating on American soil with fully automatic machine guns, they too had no responsibility for that. But through the use of, uh, I believe it was podcasting as well as being on the radio, uh, Amy Goodman was able to, with Democracy Now!, actually record the police saying that. <laughs> she went up and said, is it your responsibility to clean up this body? He said, no, 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 that's someone else's responsibility. So that guy over there? Yeah, that's the guy. She goes over to him, same thing, keeps going, keeps getting the runaround, and then she publishes it online. Miraculously, on the 10th or 11th day, they cleaned the body up. So by getting the word out about what was happening in these areas, we were able to affect some change. And it made me realize that it's not totally hopeless, but it's pretty goddamn hopeless. It's a pretty bad set of things that happened in New Orleans. So there were a lot of military checkpoints inside of New Orleans, and the way in which that I was able to get through them is the same way that all of you guys hack through firewalls and hack boxes in your uh, legal lab, of course. Um, identifying the systems at work and exploiting the weaknesses that are there. I supposedly joined a group called Part 15, which was a loose organization of wireless nonprofits that were working together in order to restore communications in the region. And while this was true, I was primarily working with the Common Ground Collective in order to bring medical supplies, food, water, internet access, and just general help to people who had gashes in their heads that were three inches long and no one was going to give them medical attention. And people who were 55 years old with gangrene and diabetes and were being left to die in their house by their government. People who had no roof anymore. When you walk down the street in New Orleans, you'd see houses with lights on. And the reason that their lights were on is because those people had died while they were asleep. And none of those people had their bodies cleaned out. And very few times would you actually see people that were alive. This man stayed, for example. On the, on the buildings, there were these things called demort codes, which is pretty bad. It's what it sounds like. It's the uh, FEMA mortuary response team. They kick down doors. They search the house, find bodies. Here is one of the photos where we had found uh, a nursing home, probably one of the nursing homes that was later um, on the news for having euthanized people. Um, where there were eight dead bodies inside. And when we rolled up and we showed our press passes, some of which were legitimate, some of them were not legitimate, they told us that we had to leave. Guns unholstered, just kind of standing there, blocking our way. This isn't for you to see. And it was the same story all over New Orleans. Nobody wanted to show the dead bodies. Nobody wanted to show the massive fuck-ups. Everybody wanted to see order. And as a result, that's what you saw after a couple of days, because the traditional media loses interest in anything. It's not interactive. People can't ask the kinds of questions that they need to ask. There was one building I found, which was a school. And the DMARC code, 
I hope is not correct, and to this day I do not know, but it said something over 50 on the, so a children's school with all these dead bodies inside of it. And the soldiers standing next to the school, I asked them, is this possible that there are 50 dead bodies in this building? You're just standing next to this. I'm just wondering, is it possible that that's the case? And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's not, it's not my jurisdiction. It's not, that's not for me to know. And, uh, <laughs> and so the longer I stayed there, the more I realized that things were not changing. Uh, at some point, I, uh, I, had to, I had to do some interviews with some news agencies talking about this. And they had asked me who is responsible for saving Algiers. And Algiers, again, is this place across the Mississippi River. And the person who is responsible for stopping huge race riots, huge amounts of violence, and bringing together a community so that they could distribute supplies without any government help because the government wasn't helping them, was Malik Rahim. He is his house in Algiers that was used as a home base. It was his house that was the original media center where people, independent journalists from Europe mostly, but also the Guerrilla News Network, myself, and. Joel Johnson from Gizmodo and other, and other people, um, Indie Media, they were able to work out of this house and they were able to write about things without fear of being censored by the people they were staying with, without having to be locked inside their house by uh, Blackwater security guards. So we decided that we were going to set up a radio station with information, but this time we had learned from Houston and we just set up a pirate radio station. So, the FCC, although they were issuing permits, we decided it was not worth complying with the American federal law because it was just getting in the way. So we set up a, a radio station, again with information, so that people around the area who had radios could know. And we also set up voice over IP links so that people could call their loved ones, so that people could contact people that were displaced, so people could have a phone number that they could be reached at because most of these people were so poor and so destitute that they did not even have a computer in their home or on their block. Some of these people had never even touched a keyboard before, and often they had trouble dialing telephones. And the amount of gentrification that happened in New Orleans as a result of this is astounding. Entire communities are completely wiped out, completely taken, and it's amazing because this American disaster is a lot like the other American disaster I witnessed, Iraq. It's the same thing over and over again. The disconnection, the lack of feeling of humanity, the lack of these people being worth living, uh, worth living for, helping, saving, none of that matters, apparently. Now, there were a few people that did care. It seems like even now it's not part of the American zeitgeist. It's sort of like Hurricane Katrina almost never happened. And the Iraq war, well, isn't that over already? I, I haven't heard anything about it. But it isn't. And the reason it isn't getting better, and the reason things are not improving, and the reason the war is not ending is because we're letting it be that way. We are all complicit in the murder of hundreds of people in the accidental deaths through starvation or whatever the case may be, and however someone would die with their shoes off in an area of New Orleans that didn't even flood. But when we all stand idly by, we contribute to this. And we can't do that anymore. We have to stop that. The things that happened to my father, it took me a long time to realize it, but it's not an isolated incident. And the things that happened in Iraq, they're not an isolated incident. The way that our Western society exists is on the back of other societies and we're actively exploiting those societies so that we can have a better standard of living, but we're closing our eyes to the real costs of this. And the real cost of this is that we are killing people every day. The day before yesterday in Baghdad, I was told by a friend of mine that six car bombs went off. How, how far into the war are we now that six, six car bombs could go off? That's, that's quite amazing to me that that could happen still. It's still happening right now. The war is still going on. People are still suffering. People are still dying. And in New Orleans, there are still people who don't have houses, whose houses have been demolished, whose family members have not been found. So,
what you can do is sort of up to you. It depends on your skill set. I think that it's important to realize that there's a world outside of the computer. And of course, almost everyone here knows that. I'm sure of it. You're conscious. You're awake. You're paying attention. But the question is, what are you working towards in your life? Are you trying to find fulfillment through empty, meaningless, material wealth? Are you trying to look your best so that you can find a mate? Are you trying to just be happy and content? Or are you trying to eradicate the things that you yourself would not want to endure? Are you trying to make the world a better place through strong cryptography and awesome system administration? Are you volunteering your time? Or are you working for nonprofits? Are you working for commercial organizations that help these people? Are you working for privacy, anonymity, freedom, transparency? I'm sure you are because that's what we all need to be doing now. This concept that we've lost the war is wrong. The people that are dead, the people that I saw bloating in the sun, the people whose family members in Iraq have been eradicated by the American government, the people who, to this day, live in fear that the standard operating procedure of the US military is going to wipe them out, those are the people who lost the war. We are all alive. We are still breathing. We have not lost the war, and you would be a coward to say that we have lost the war and to give up. So, don't give up. Fight every battle. Stand against injustice. Stop this crap from happening in the future, because it will happen here again, in every country in the world, and everywhere else in the world will ignore it if we continue to be complicit in it. So when it happens in America, when it happens in Iraq, when it happens to the Armenians, when it happens to the Kurds, when it happens to anyone, we have to stop it. We can't let this happen again. So if anyone has any questions, I'm sure there's lots of technical details that I've left out. Like I didn't really tell you about the fact that the, there are great covert channels of communication when you have satellites that are monitored by the American government. Um, I didn't really talk about people using crypto. There aren't many people using crypto. Um, reporters who report things over, over the internet are often visited by people from the military telling them to change their stories when they report them to the editors didn't really talk about that or touch on any of it. So there's lots of specific details that I can give you. So, um, Do you think personal publishing, the weblog things, uh, helped you somehow uh, in making other people paying attention? I definitely think so. I think that the hundreds of thousands of people that read and contributed, uh, they definitely were able to make phone calls. They were definitely able to get people to care, to donate money, to donate hardware, to donate their houses for people to sleep in, to bring food. There are so many people that when I tell them about what I've seen in Iraq and what I've seen in New Orleans and Houston, those people, they, they give up their lives to go do something else. I have a friend, her name is Katie, whose last name will go unnamed for now who, after seeing and hearing this, when I originally talked about it at Webzine in San Francisco, she joined the International Solidarity Movement and is in Palestine now, working for these people who are being oppressed by Israeli apartheid. That's awesome. That's what we need. Just that fact that this one person went and did that is worth it to me. When I went to Iraq, I knew that I would either come back whole or I would come back full of holes. But either way, the parts of me that needed to die, the parts that didn't care, that didn't have compassion for other living human beings and other living beings that weren't human, those things are gone now. And that's what's important, is that we all lose this disconnection that the person sitting next to you is not equal to you, is not worth caring about. So, any more questions?
I'd love to know more about the satellite technology you were mentioning. Okay, so um, the satellite technology that I was using was a Hughes system, which is basically, I believe, 1.5 megabit down and something like 512 up. Has about five seconds of latency sometimes, which is pretty awful. It's not encrypted over the air in a way that it is secure. So when I was communicating over the satellite, I used SSH tunnels. All of the satellite protocols seem to do really funky stuff with TCP IP. So almost everybody has DNS caches and proxies for everything. So everything that you do that's encrypted, it's kind of weird. Uh, when you send a SYN, you get a SYN ACK immediately. But that's not possible because the packet has to travel into space, back down. Once it's at the terrestrial uplink, it goes onto the internet. And just the mere fact that this kind of mucking around happens, it means things kind of behave unreliably. So DNS is captured by pretty much everybody. And it makes phone conversations kind of difficult. It's kind of like using uh, a half duplex radio with someone that's never picked up a telephone or something. Um, that was a stationary VSAT. You can get mobile VSATs that do tracking at 110 kilometers an hour on a vehicle, which would probably be really useful to you if you needed to do stuff like what the Falun Gong did when they hacked Chinese television. More, more props to those guys and Captain Midnight. Um, those uh, technologies, though, are a little bit more expensive. Um, the people that were using satellite phones that I knew there were using Thiraya satellite phones, and it's pretty expensive. It can be, I believe, over a euro a minute. Um, and they're going to work only outside unless you set up uh, lots of antennas inside. So, uh, yes? You mentioned the question that you asked your partners in, uh, in Iraq and in Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. What are the main questions they ask you? Are there any ones that stand out in your memory right now? Yes. There's one that really stands out in my memory, actually. Why is this happening to me? Was one of the questions that I was asked all the time. Why is this happening to me? Why are the people of your country letting this happen? And I couldn't give them a good answer because I pay taxes to the United States government and those taxes go and make bombs that fall on their buildings. So I couldn't come up with a good answer but lots of people have been working towards good answers, saying that we don't want that to happen anymore. But the other questions they wanted to know are, do people realize that we're just like them? Do we just want to have a family and live safely? We just want to be loved? We just want the same freedom that you supposedly have in America? And uh, pretty much everyone just felt like they were shocked that People didn't realize how bad it was every day. Do you realize how bad it is every day? Every day I leave my house and I kiss my wife goodbye because that may be the very last time that I ever see her alive. Every day. Pretty intense. And I said, I didn't know that. I don't think very many Americans know that. And when I was on a flight from New Orleans, leaving on my way to Atlanta, I sat next to a woman who was pretty, it was pretty appalling what she had to say, but she said, I just don't understand, and then she shoved some food in her mouth. How it was that these people, and then she shoved some more food in her mouth, did not leave New Orleans. I mean, I heard that we needed to leave, so I got in my car and I drove, I mean, after I heard it on the television, I got in my car and I drove to my summer house in Georgia. I don't understand why these people didn't leave. I mean, what's wrong with them? They had ample warning. And I heard that the mayor said they were going to send buses for everybody. So I told her that most of the time the buses didn't come, and most of the people didn't watch TV because they couldn't afford one, and pretty much nobody there had so much as a summer home, let alone actually owning their own home. And she just couldn't, she couldn't understand this. And it's that kind of disconnect with our own neighbors that allows us to have that kind of disconnect with the, the world and everyone in it. So we have to strive to get rid of that disconnect. 
Any more questions before I go? Yeah. Um, have you met many people in the time you travel around uh, which are at the same point as you are, I think? Uh, I mean, the point where you say, I spent the maximum of my life and my energy to do such things, to help other people. Um, I have. I've met lots of career activists that do this. And these career activists now are living under watch lists with tapped telephones. And the repercussions of caring about the planet, the environment, about social justice, equality, rights, economic equality, just freedom, these people are all in bad places as a result. Places like Greenpeace, for example, where while I no longer work there, you know, they could be considered a terrorist organization by certain wings of the American government. So the price certainly is high for doing this, but there are other people out there that are doing it. And I'm not suggesting that you give up your life and stop buying things and just go live a, you know, anti-materialistic Buddhist monetary lifestyle or something like. I'm suggesting that we be conscious in our life of the things that we support, not just with our dollars, but with our feet and with our mouths and with our work. So. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you.